I'm Daniel. I've been researching 19th century performance practice for a little while now, and I wanted to share with you how you can apply some of these things to Saw's Etude Number no. 1 in C major. Um, I want to talk about topics like um, mood and character, accentuation, dynamics, um, harmony, and some little things in between those. Um, so the first thing I want to do is play you the first couple measures just to remind you uh, what this etude sounds like. So the first thing I want to talk about is mood and character. 19th century musicians, performers and composers left us quite a lot of information about this. Um, for them, each key uh, represented or evoked different moods and characters. Um, so I have here three different quotes um, about C major. So I just want to read them to you. The first says, C major, a pure, certain and decisive manner, full of innocence, earnestness, deepest religious feeling. The second, completely pure, its character is innocence, simplicity, naivety, and children's talk. And the third, state of nature, virginal chastity and purity, lovely innocence of youth. So I want to play you this etude again and see if any of those um, moods and characters are sort of suggested by the music. The next thing I want to talk to you about is accentuation. In the 19th century and previous centuries, we have um, lots of information that suggests these musicians and composers were thinking about um, accentuation a little bit differently to how we do today. Um, modern performances of Etude Number no. 1, for example, tend to emphasize each beat um, equally. So this is in, this is in 3 4 meter, um, and so it would sound something like this in a modern performance. However, information from 19th century sources uh, tells us that they were actually um, accenting the downbeat and then lifting the following two beats. Um, so it sounds something like this on an open string. So if you apply that to the etude, And if you apply that consistently through a piece of music, you'll actually discover that composers were very aware of this um, accentuation pattern. And they would write the structure of the music in accordance to uh, that system of accentuation. Um, so I hope you uh, try and practice that um, accentuation pattern just on an open string to get that sense and that feeling. It's a lot easier than just diving straight into the music and trying to apply it. And then once that's comfortable, you can uh, try and apply it to your pieces and see if it brings out any new nuances or um, see what it does for your playing. And I think it'll open up some new dimensions in, in your rhythmic playing of 19th century music. Next, I want to talk to you about dynamics. Uh, dynamics can be quite a complex topic. Um, obviously, there can be a lot of subtlety and a lot of personal preference, but there is some information that um, can give us a few guidelines as to um, how to approach dynamics in 19th century music. So I just want to read a couple of quotes by Dionisio Aguado. Um, the first one says, The same sound allows infinite modifications of pianissimo to fortissimo. 
depending on the strength the right hand uses to pluck it without moving from one spot. And this operation can be varied as often as the hand can change position. Um, the second quote, it is also necessary to bear in mind the sense of the notes in each melody in the phrase. While they rise, the sound gradually is intensified and tends to decrease when they fall. So the two sort of takeaways you can get from that is these musicians were using infinite modifications, anywhere from pianissimo to fortissimo. And generally, if the melody rises, the sound will intensify or crescendo. And when the melody uh, falls, then the sound will decrease. Uh, so you can actually apply this to a lot of music, but this applies quite well to etude number one. Again, composers were very aware of this and they wrote this into the structure of the music. So um, if you apply this consistently, um, you'll find that, again, I think you can open up some new dimensions and really bring out the musical structure that the composer intended. The final thing I want to talk to you about is harmony and a, a few different things associated with harmony. Um, Harmony can basically be sort of um, broken down into two categories, which is uh, consonance and dissonance. Um, dissonance tends to be tension and consonance tends to be resolution or repose. Um, and I've got a really nice quote here from uh, a theorist in 1789 who says, good taste has made it a rule that dissonances and discords should preferably and as a rule be more pronounced than consonances, for it is especially by discords that the emotions are aroused. If, when following this rule, one pays particular attention to the degree of the discord, it follows that the sharper the dissonance or the more dissonances occur in a chord, the more it must be emphasized. Yet this rule cannot and should not be observed too strictly, or there might be too much diversity." Um, so. Uh, this etude um, has some pretty obvious examples of um, discords or dissonances uh, resolving to consonances right in the first two measures. So the opening um, measure is pretty much just a C major chord, but then listen to what happens in the second measure. two dissonant consonant resolutions. The first one, which is a 4-3, uh, the C over the G resolving down to the B. And then we have uh, another 4-3, but up higher. So we can uh, linger on those a little bit and make them, we can uh, arouse the emotions uh, from those chords. One device that we can use to uh, even further heighten the tension of dissonances is vibrato. Um, we have to be a little bit careful about vibrato and not to overuse it, but also not to underuse it. it, it when used um, appropriately, it can be very powerful. Um, so we can, we can use it in those uh, two dissonant places that I just mentioned. Some 
um, guitarists who left symbols for vibrato. Um, Aguado is one of them, and Sidney Pratton is another. Um, it looks a little bit like a sort of squiggly line above the note. Um, so sometimes they wrote this in and sometimes they didn't. I think um, it was more of a matter of the taste and um, opinion of the performer. So um, I hope you think about uh, vibrato and where the most um, sort of appropriate and striking places to use vibrato is. Um, obviously you can try out different approaches too, but the one thing I can suggest is whenever you find a dissonant chord or interval, that's probably a good opportunity for vibrato. So I just wanted to conclude by playing Saw's Etude in full. Um, and I hope that while you play it, you, you'll think about some of the points that I, that I made um, about mood and character, accentuation, dynamics, and the effects of harmony. Um, I'll do my best to uh, try and incorporate all of that into this performance. <laughs>